thing that you can do is to invest on the long-term trend. And what Soros is saying is his ideas, his theories have guided his investments and he has been successful, although he also knows an enormous amount about financial markets. So it's not enough just to know the theory. So I think that Soros has formulated an alternative to equilibrium theory in economics. And I would, I'm now trying to promote his theory just to see what sort of a reaction I can get among economists. I think it'll lead to an interesting discussion. Because the underlying proposition, if you believe in the correspondence uh, principle, is amount of attention paid to the observer or the participants and the, and the use of knowledge in the economic system not simply assuming that knowledge and information is uniformly and instantly distributed. Okay, now I'm going to shift to a more philosophical direction. Any questions up to now? Yes? Just a reflection. Soros might be not right because of these, what you talked about, him, that he sells, then the publishers, and then market collapse. Yes. Absolutely. 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 No, that's exactly what happens. And he knows that's what happens. And that's what his theory of reflexivity describes. And in a sense, that's why he decided to go public. You see, in a sense, he was doing very, very well as a virtually unknown investor. He was only known as, as being highly clever by the people in a small community. So many people said, well, why do you want to go public with your theory and so forth? Because that just calls attention to you. But you can use that because you start buying, and then the world, word leaks out, Soros is buying. So everybody else starts buying. So then you start selling, and people say, oh, Soros is selling. So they start selling. But if you're in front of the pack, that's fine. OK, so I would claim that we have here another instance of the cybernetics of science. Or you have the incommensurable definitions between reflex, uh, equilibrium theory and reflexivity theory and the correspondence principle where the participation of the observer is a part of the system. Now, what I'm doing here is describing, in a sense, what I have learned about the advance of science. That is, science advances when you can state a new dimension. And you can then build upon previous theories so that all the data that was explained before you still have, but now you can explain additional data. as in accord with this diagram. All right, so here is the kind of summary of the three points of view that I thought described cybernetics up until November of last year. Uh, so you have engineering or first order cybernetics, and I've gone through that, biological or second order cybernetics, and I've gone through those propositions. Now let me review for you the social cybernetics position. It's a pragmatic view of epistemology. That is, knowledge is constructed to achieve human purposes. The intent is not so much to create an accurate description, but just to come up with a set of guidelines about how to act that is effective. The distinction is between the biology of cognition and the observer as a social participant. Soros doesn't pay much attention to the biology of cognition. He just says observers have biases. But he's very much interested in their biases and how they choose to act on those biases, or preconceptions, or mental models, whatever you want to call it. And the issue here in social cybernetics is the difference between the natural sciences and the social sciences. That in the natural sciences, you do not have reflexivity as a case. That is, the behavior of atoms doesn't change. 
when you change your theory of physics from the Newtonian world to the quantum mechanical world. Atoms still do what they were always doing. But in the case of economic systems, if Adam Smith comes along and has a new interpretation of the accumulation of wealth and people act upon that, the economic system changes. If Marx comes up with a theory of the labor theory of value and people act on that, the social system changes. Uh, if Friedman uh, advances monetary uh, theory and people act upon it, the system behaves differently. And you develop your theories in order to change the way the social system operates. That reflexivity doesn't exist in the natural sciences, but it certainly exists in the social sciences. So the notion is that people can create, maintain, and change social systems through language and ideas. So if we can become aware of that, that is we can reflect upon the process and design ideas that we think will have a beneficial impact, test them out, see if the benefits really are beneficial. If not, come up with another idea. Uh, you can change societies. And people tend to accept ideas if they serve their purposes as a social participant. People may have different ideas about how to improve society. Uh, so you have competition in ideas. But by transforming conceptual systems through persuasion, not coercion, we can change society. So that's the point of view of social cybernetics. Now, and that's the way I was thinking about the history of cybernetics up until November. But in November, I was in Vienna for a meeting of the Heinz von Forster Society. The Austrians have created a Heinz von Forster Society. And over dinner, Carl Mueller, the guy that invented the epigenetic theory, asked me about an article that Heinz von Forster had written called uh, Computing in the Semantic Domain, Semantic Domain. And he said that in that article, uh, von Forster had postulated a triangle consisting of world, description, and observer. And he said that one side of the triangle, number one, is syntactics, syntactical relationships like mathematical equations, deductive proofs, etc., the form of the argument. Semantics is the relationship between the description of the observer, but von Forster never defined what the third side of the triangle was. And so Carl asked my opinion, and I said, that's pragmatics. That is how an observer acts in the world. But after that dinner conversation, I thought, gee, you know, that's very much like my little table. So that number one is engineering cybernetics, Number two is biological cybernetics. And number three is social cybernetics. So I began to see how the three views of cybernetics are related to one another and how they fit together and how they constitute a whole. And that led to a reconceptualization of what second order cybernetics should be. Because second order cybernetics, as I have described it up to now, is basically number two, okay? It's the neurophysiological part. It's, it's how an observer creates a description of the world. But you could define second order cybernetics as the whole triangle. That is, as the higher level analysis, as a theory of epistemologies. So in a sense, you can see this as a theory of epistemology, of three facets to a unified epistemology, unified theory of knowledge. And I think that's the more interesting interpretation. Okay. Now this is the way von Forster described it. So he had syntactics, semantics, and then pragmatics. That's one, two, and three. The advantage of this formulation is that it makes very clear what each point of view overlooks or tends to minimize in importance. So that in this number one, on that side of the triangle, 
you have classical science. That is, you have theories and empirical evidence. You have a description of the world, and you test it against the world. But what you have neglected, what you have explicitly excluded, is the observer. Okay, the observer is not permitted in, the, in that conception, in that epistemology. The observer is not included. Now, if you take the second side of the triangle, where you have an observer creating descriptions of the world, you have explicitly excluded the world. You've said the world, the logic of the world is the logic of descriptions of the world. That's what von Forster said. There is no world. It's only descriptions of the world because we have no immediate access to the world. The world, our knowledge of the world is always mediated by our, our, our senses. And similarly, in number three, that's the kind of American pragmatic point of view, you have action by observers in the world, but very little attention to language or descriptions. And that's understandable because Americans only have one language. Most people, most academics around the world know at least two languages. Americans are confined within a single language, and hence, language is invisible to them. They're like fish living in water. They don't know how language constrains their perceptual apparatus, which helps them to act within the world, but encumbers their descriptions of the world. So the epistemological triangle, uh, you can think of number one, the left side as being a representation conception of truth. That is where you're always trying to get your theory to match your empirical observations. Number two, the coherence conception of truth. I'm in the middle there. Uh, you want to get your theoretical statements to match your experiences. You're trying to get things to, to fit together as a, a coherent pattern. And under the, com the pragmatic conception of truth, uh, if it works, great. Uh, Americans have a very strong tendency to test claims against experience. Somebody makes a claim, they say, well, let's try it. <laughs> if it works, do some more of it. If it doesn't, forget it. Europeans are much more likely to be enchanted by the theory itself. And if the theory has a beauty of its own, whether it works is sort of a minor consideration. And I think you need both, because I am very attracted by the European point of view, uh, but I live in the American point of view. Now, I'm not sure about whether British empiricism is right. I, I think that's just sort of the classical scientific method. I'm pretty convinced that German idealism is an issue and that American pragmatism is an issue, but British empiricism probably ought to just be classical conceptions of science. Uh, inanimate objects was where the, that first side of the triangle was developed. Knowing subjects and the need to cope with knowing subjects is consistent with a later trend in science where you had controlled groups and experimental groups. And in the case of social reforms, uh, you have what I call contested objectivity. So you go from unquestioned objectivity to constructed objectivity to contested object. Contested objectivity means that if you're implementing a social reform, like a voucher system in education or a school busing program or a virgin lands program in the Soviet Union, you have interest groups. And some people will be in favor and some people will be opposed. And you have to reconcile those different views and they will have different descriptions, which are expressed in the political process. So that what works is not only a scientific question, it's a political question. And that's what I mean by contested objectivity. Form is what von Forster says is in classical science you can have mathematical proofs, but to give meaning to things, you need to understand the observer. To distinguish between form and meaning, Think of the example of objects, tokens for eigen behaviors, and the notion of the table, where a computer can transform table into tish, uh, into messe, is it, or messen? 
Mesa. Mesa, yeah, Mesa as in a 